Why isn't it more sexy or cool? Or is there anything in about its evolution or its history or the story we've created thus far that's, that's rendered it sort of into the dustbin of cool things to talk about? Because in reality, all the things that are going on are sort of maybe the coolest things that we have to offer as Americans right now. Yeah, I think there are, there are a couple aspects to this. You know, one of them is that t time was, it was a different story. You know, Thomas yeah. Edison was a pretty cool dude in his day. Yeah. Nikolai Tesla was like a really edgy cool dude in his day. And this was the most interesting thing going on around you. Now I think it's hard. It's faded into the fabric of our existence. It's something we expect just to happen when we turn on the switch. And it's not something that you can see or touch. If you had a friend who ran around constantly obsessing about, you know, the ghosts uh, that were flitting in and out of every home that you can't see and you can't feel and they don't really affect you, but they're really important, you'd probably think that they were neurotic, crazy, or both. You might be thought of that way. Yeah. If you obsess about these mysterious electrons that somehow no one has ever seen. Yeah. With that said, I think on the other side, it, it's a different story. Uh, you know, who is the most celebrated entrepreneur in the U.S. right now? It is Elon Musk. What has Elon Musk done? Tesla, you know, as member of the board of directors, chairman Solar City, uh, and SpaceX, all of which are about energy and resources in different ways. So I, I, I'm not sure this is the completely 100% dorky topic. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's 98% dorky yeah. topic, but there are points of light. You know, in energy, there's a challenge in that the things that are important are not necessarily the things that look cool. <laughs> you know, on one hand, we have a whole bunch of technologies available to us today that are good. And what takes things like that from good to great is unglamorous and unsexy continued effort. Nobody celebrates the dude at the plant who figured out, I can run this conveyor belt 1.2 times faster and increase solar panel output. But when you do that, they end up costing less. And that little change on top of another change and another change and another change gets you a point where you're economically competitive. Maybe one of the unintended consequences of the sort of the digital, digital age and the, you know, the sort of the fortunes that have made in social media and internet and sure. online things is that these expectations of return. It's so much easier to um, invest in Snapchat, right? I mean, but, right? but, but that's what's happening. That? Somebody moved the cheese. So I, this is the weird sort of paradox when it comes to clean energy startup companies. Nobody disagrees that if you had the small, compact, distributed, emissions-free power generator, you would have an enormously valuable business, right? Everybody gets that at a basic level. But now let's go to the next, next step and let's think that you have, you know, $2 you can invest in a business. Um, and on one hand, you can invest in the guy developing the clean energy generator, which when he gets there, right, will be extremely valuable, but is gonna need a lot of time, is gonna need a lot of money, because he's gotta build physical stuff, right? You know, objects that are heavy and made out of steel. Right. Now some other guy comes in, right, and says, hey, uh, I gotta feed programmers pizza for a couple of months, I'm gonna put this thing on the app store, it either hits or it doesn't, but if it doesn't, you haven't put a lot of money in, and if it does, you could make a thousand times your money. Would you give the first guy your two bucks? Would you give them each one, or the second guy your two dollars? I'm willing to bet the second guy wins. Yeah. About the time that I, that I had children, I realized that that's what the last 30 or 40 years had been about. Sort of the story of humanity was about the microprocessor and all the things that it enabled that changed our lives. But I felt like the next 30 or 40 years was about how you would scale the planet for 11 billion people. And you know, in the US, we, we build a new power plant to meet new demands like once every six months. In China, they put one up every week. Yes. And I felt like, you know, both from a, a perspective of doing something lucrative and of doing something that makes a difference, that, that was the right target, the, these developing countries that are getting rich fast. Wow. Why do you hear people saying, oh, the grid, you know, the grid is the problem, the grid is a problem, why do we have to be worrying about the grid as well as everything else? Yeah. I think about this like things that are evolved versus things that are designed. If, if, if you uh. want to make a sleek, object that will move through the water and intercept its prey, and you get to start with a blank sheet of paper, you will make a stealth submarine, and it will be very well engineered. If, like Mother Nature did, you have to start with a mouse, you will get a duck-billed platypus, <laughs> which, which gets the job done, but has some engineering constraints you would not design in if you had, had the blank sheet of paper. Think of the power grid like that. 
You know, we inherited an enormous amount of money that was spent to build these big centralized generating stations and build these giant transmission lines and power lines running down every street. And at every turn, when we've had to do something new, so that if uh, part of the system goes down, we're not all hosed. And we spend billions of dollars to build this generator just so that when everybody's jacking up the AC on August 15th, uh, you know, everything doesn't go down. That's silly. We've got Band-Aid on top of Band-Aid on top of Band-Aid on top of Band-Aid. We can't see what we covered in the first place. Oh my God. That's the challenge with the grid. What we'd really like to do is be able to sense when everybody's jacking their air conditioning up and then provide people with some kind of incentive. Hey, you know, if you'll go to 78 degrees rather than 72 degrees, we'll kick you some money. Uh, you know, or just the social good. You know, right. you will be contributing to there not being a blackout, right? right. You know, that requires some, some intelligence. It requires sensors, it requires communication. That's the idea behind a smart grid, per se. So when uh, you know, a, a new community gets developed and you build power infrastructure to go out to it, transmission lines, distribution lines, they are sized at something like two times or more uh, you know, what the average usage is. Because they have to be sized for the hottest day in August. Wow. In the middle of the afternoon and the coldest night in the winter, right? Maybe a third or a fourth of that level. So we have all this capacity and we very rarely use it. The holy grail is being able to move it around, right? Yeah. You know, if at night we're down here, and in the middle of the afternoon we're up here, you know, if we could take some of the stuff we made in the middle of the night and store it, so we've got it ready to send out the following afternoon, we don't have to build that other power plant we turn on five days a year. You know, if you buy a, a Tesla today, right, you sign a, you write a check, and half of it goes to the car, and half of it goes to the battery. Because the battery costs a lot of money, right? Mm. And we gotta find some better way, whether it's just, getting better at the existing stuff, getting cheaper and cheaper every year until we reach a point where it's economical, or, which I tend to favor, you know, finding a, a different way to be able to store electricity that could be radically less expensive. Wow, that's exciting. I mean, what's that about? I mean, what could that be, even? Yeah. So, so I was going to ask you, like, where we are with storage, because as far as I'm concerned, in, in my little foray the last yeah, while, yeah, yeah. that's the holy grail. On energy storage, that's where I think you've had this enormous amount of activity just in the past 10 or 20 years, every possible approach being taken, every... It's complicated whether the price of, of oil and natural gas yep. goes up or down. Yep. When it goes up, a part of me goes, yay, now the other renewably generated power seems more cost effective. Yep. At the same time, when the price goes up, then wildcatters can make more money and you get more exploration and more drilling and more development of fossil yep. fuels and more CO2 because it, you can make money doing that. You are correct, sir. So when it goes the other direction, the problem when the price drops down is then like, well, then it's really cheap and it discourages. So the answer to that, yeah. Jamie, yeah. we wouldn't be having these debates as a society if the renewable stuff we had was just better, just cheaper, more plentiful, more flexible, more reliable, better in every dimension. That's how we got nuclear, it's how we got coal, it's how we got natural gas. Our challenge is that we haven't gotten to renewables that are better on every dimension. The factor with that ends up being scale because it's a lot cheaper to make a whole bunch of things at one time than to make a few of them as one-offs. And the whole role of subsidies in our society is the idea that eventually down the road, we think these things can compete on a completely level playing field. But we gotta give them some help to get started and to get scaled. The oil industry, the coal industry, natural gas extraction also benefited from those subsidies in the past and continue to benefit from them today. Right. It seems to me that, you know, being better, um, that renewables are going to be tasked with, the, with, they're going to be tasked with the job of being better even in an unfair environment. Agreed with that because it's always hard to dislodge something else. And there's also a point where you reach this tipping point because all of the reasons why not fall away. As you get more scale, mm -hmm. things get less expensive. As they get less expensive, more people can do it. And there comes a point where that starts to be the better way to do things, uh, you know, rather than the path that we started out on that got us to this crisis point. And I'm optimistic that, that that tipping point happens. I don't know when. Right. I would say, you know, 50 plus or minus 50 years, maybe I'll enjoy it, maybe my grandchildren will. Yeah. 
but the trajectory is very, very clear. I've often wondered, you know, you hear about how much philanthropic resources there are out there and yep. where philanthropy focuses its mm -hmm. resources. And I've often wondered, you know, if you were to sort of do a pie chart, like how much is philanthropy doing for renewable energy? Yep, almost nothing. What? There's a study that's been done by this and energy is, is so small it doesn't really show up in the chart. Okay, uh, that's completely mind blowing. Yeah. What's going on? Why? Why? I think because it takes so long with such an uncertain outcome. You know, if you want to feel good as a philanthropist, are you going to feel better by giving money to some really bright young woman in a lab who is coming up with some generator that you don't understand, oh. or by putting mosquito nets in the hands of children in Africa? You know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And if you are concerned, you're at the end of your career, you've made a lot of money about your own longevity. Do you want someone to be successful uh, 20 years from now in solving the energy storage problem? Or do you want someone to come up with a cure for your specific form of cancer right now? Uh, those motivations you know, draw philanthropy more to life sciences and medicine than to equally big pressing problems like, like energy and resources. Yeah, because in a way what you're talking about is investing in prevention. Sure. Right. And you want to look at it from a healthcare point of view. Right. All the energy on the Earth ultimately comes from the sun. Right. And while, you know, coal and gas aren't renewable, they ultimately also came from the sun, right? You know, the sun shined on the Earth, it grew plants, dinosaurs ate those plants, they died, they were buried under rock, pressure turned them into oil, and we sucked it out of the ground millions of years later. But, you know, it all ultimately came from the sun. So in that sense, fossil energy is like eating canned food. It was plucked, right, you know, from the field, and we've stuck it on a shelf to use much, much later, right? Fossil energy is like canned food. Renewable energy is like fresh food. Let's say you wanted to have a solely fresh food diet. You weren't gonna eat anything that was processed, came in a can, came in a jar. How would you do that? Well, you would have a different diet depending on where you lived, right? Yes. If you lived next to the coast, you'd eat a lot of fish. If you lived in the Arctic, you'd eat a lot of seal. And that's why the you know, energy profile, the renewable profile in some place like Buffalo, New York, which is near a whole bunch of big rivers that have been dammed up, is gonna be a whole lot of hydro and not a lot of solar. But in New Mexico, it's gonna be the other way around. Are there enough different forms that Can you one get a balanced say, diet, yes. <laughs> Can, Can I say, there isn't a place in America where there is the right combination of renewable sources of energy that will work. So the answer to that is definitively yes. At every place on the globe, uh, it is power possible at some cost uh, to power oneself completely renewably. Even just the sun, right? <sighs> every day, the sun shines 100 times as much energy on the Earth as we use. We're just really bad at taking advantage of it. When you combine with that flowing water, heat under the ground, which is geothermal, blowing wind, tides coming in and out, biomass, absolutely anywhere on the planet you can be 100% Oh, that's, okay, that's another good reason. Cause for hope. <laughs> It's also overwhelming to understand. Like, I can't understand some of the technologies you're talking about. I certainly can't understand renewable energy credits yet. So I just decided to try and figure out my own stuff. I was all excited to put solar panels on my house. And just doing that has been really hard. And I'm thinking, what about the other um, billion of people? Is it really fair to expect them to do the kinds of things that I've been attempting to do? And I don't think it is. Like, it's got to happen in a major systemic way. The entire system is going to have to evolve to a new yeah, thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So how is that going to happen? <laughs> You're right. You know, depending on billions of people, each to take individual actions that somehow, you know, get to a whole. People have other problems, right? Yes. Like people yeah. are late for work. People have to pick their kids up from school. People have other things they've got to worry about. You've got to find some way, you know, to take the kind of change that you're envisioning and make it easy or make it automatic. And I think the biggest lever is technology change. It's got to be easy. It's got to be straightforward. And LED bulbs are the only thing on the shelf that makes it easy. Yeah. The power plant is required or the utility company is required to get a certain amount of electricity from renewables. That makes it easy. Yeah. But it is all economics. Mm -hmm. You know, people buy a commodity, whether it is coffee beans, uh, you know, or rice or electricity on price and availability. 
Mm. And if your availability is better and you're cheaper, you win the game. Yeah. And the challenge for all these companies, all these people in renewable energies, is to get to the point where it's just better. And I have faith we'll do that. If you look at people who are really on the vanguard, you know, of, of renewables taken to the extreme, you often find it in the military. And the reason is that for them to use a fuel has a really high cost. The term that the U.S. military uses is FBF, the fully burdened cost of fuel. You know, we stick a radar unit in the mountains in Afghanistan. It's powered off a diesel generator. That thing has to get fuel. So now we got a truck going up the mountain to give it fuel every couple of weeks. Well, that truck is now a target for dudes with RPGs. So now we need tanks around the truck that's bringing the fuel. But now those tanks are also targets for IEDs, so we need air cover to protect the tanks, which protect the truck, which delivers the diesel, which runs the radar unit. And when you add up all those costs, you know, it's not three bucks a gallon or four bucks a gallon, it's 40 or 100 or 200 bucks a gallon. It's kind of like how you think if we accounted for the carbon dioxide, for all the bad stuff that comes from it going into the air, you know, the storm damage that's coming years down the road or the crop blight that's coming years in the future, if we loaded those costs in, we'd have more uh, expensive power. Well, the military actually has to do that. Yeah, they, it's it very to real fuel. to them. Yeah. This isn't a concept. Somewhere buried in all this has to be the, the, the human cost, too. I mean, Absolutely. You know, I mean, look, for God's sake, there's that. Is there a closed system operating within the military anywhere right now with renewables? Yeah, so the, the leader in this is the U.S. Navy, hmm. which has made a big commitment to sort of renewable energy generally, but specifically to renewable fuel, to being able to get the fuel that drives the battleship, uh, you know, from the sun and not from an oil field in the Middle East somewhere. Uh, you know, they are the leader. There's been these various points in the last couple of months where yeah. I just sort of wanted to throw my hands up. And for me, the most recent one was an article in Scientific American that's, that said, all right, uh, you know, yeah, we're all worried about climate change, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, and we got a problem with fossil fuels. Uh, but let's introduce a new anxiety into the mix. <laughs> so uh, that would be agriculture. So suddenly, um, cows are proliferating, you know, wildly on a global scale because there's a demand. And now it's like, it's not just deforestation. It's that what happens on that land once the deforestation occurs, bad enough to get rid of all the, you know, oxygen producing yeah. rainforest. But guess what? Now we're putting in place of that, we're putting animals that are farting us into oblivion, from what Absolutely. I understand. We are literally being doomed by cow farts. Yeah, methane is a 10 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, so uh, those farts can kill you. <laughs> so how do we turn fartpocalypse into fartopia? <laughs> <laughs> and the issue there, right, is that if you end up producing a lot of biological gases, either from uh, you know, animal manure or whatever else, can you capture that and at least make some power from it along the way? So you get you know, two, two bites at the apple, so to speak. That's one thing you can do. Uh, and there are farms that are doing that. It's kind of interesting work. It's kind of dirty work. You may want to wear hip waders, but you know, it, it's out there and, and something for you to look at. Nuclear is a major hot potato. Sure. And um, you know, I, grew up, I grew up in the 70s. As far as being in Manhattan, you know, when Three Mile Island happened, I mean, you could go to Japan right now and have sure. some very interesting conversations. When is, when is nuclear going to lose all of its downsides? Mm -hmm. And will, can it? I don't think you can have the discussion without recognizing the tragedy and loss at Chernobyl, at Fukushima. But when you look at it in a kind of broader perspective, the safety record of the nuclear industry is actually really good. And the, the coal dangers are many, many times worse than the nuclear ones. The, the state of play in nuclear today does not look like, uh, you know, the technologies and siting decisions, et cetera, you know, that led to real tragedies like Fukushima. We have today, right, you know, a highly proven, we have a country in the world, France, that runs 80 plus percent on nuclear power, uh, that produces no carbon dioxide emissions at the point of generation. There are a small number of publicly funded nuclear fusion developments. 
Um, but then there were some startup companies that fly completely underneath the radar. Mm. And you know, many of them don't announce anything about what they're up to. They are funded by various and sundry uh, you know, investors who really believe this could be the holy grail and have the patience to get there. I, I, that know, sounds cool. I, I have been to facilities like this, right? Wow. And I, I, I need to stop there for a range right. of reasons. But uh, Americans love a conspiracy theory, you know? But maybe but this, this is, is a, a conspiracy one. of the best kind. Right. It is a conspiracy to save the world. Yeah. Question is, is, what is the role of natural gas? And I think in the community, there are two schools of thought. One of them is that the problem is coal and natural gas isn't good, but it's only half as bad as coal is, and you know, that's okay. And that because, uh, you know, we can turn natural gas plants on and off really quickly, they're pretty well suited to filling in the gaps in between wind and solar's output, and maybe those things can work together. That's kind of the, the bridge view. Mm -hmm. Then there is the other view, the deep green view, which is, nope, anything that puts more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is just bad, and a little bit bad, and a lot bad have no difference between them. And if we're getting to the same destination anyway, why are we taking a longer amount of time to get there? Well, you just described two different points of view. What's yours, first of point of view? Uh, I think that economics rule the day. Uh, and that we have figured out, in this country in particular, uh, how to lower the cost of natural gas by a lot. And that there's no solution that we have that has no trade-offs. We're just trying to minimize the trade-offs. From that perspective, natural gas as a bridge is pretty good. Mm. I would be sad if my grandchildren's grandchildren viewed themselves as living in a natural gas world. Mm. But if my grandchildren live in it, I'm not sure that's so bad. Mm. I just feel like you know, how, how do we possibly get around, you know, the stalemate and the broken political process? And, you know, nobody's inspired by what's happening in D.C. How do you view that from, you know, uh, where we are politically? And yeah, yeah. So I I as effective as it may be, no one wants to aspire to totalitarianism. So let's take that <laughs> off the table. I, I, all these things just, they just come down to values. You know, to what we value as a society. Like, for example, we might agree you know, that your hometown should be powered renewably. Great, but what does that mean? Does that mean that we should buy enough electricity uh, that somewhere on the planet, even if it can't physically reach me, did not put carbon into the atmosphere? Basically, we encourage somebody to do it somewhere, therefore it matters. Or is what you value my backyard, jobs for people putting up solar panels down the street from my house, less pollution in my air. In both cases, getting the same impact from a kind of carbon climate change perspective, but your values are different, right? It's either about the carbon dioxide in the air or building your community. You can disagree at that level, right? You know, and there are a lot of folks who are on the kind of opposite side of the political spectrum where you would expect to see greenie weenies yeah. uh, who do have solar panels in the house and the natural gas generator downstairs, precisely yeah. because when the hurricane hits, they don't want to depend on the man. Yeah and they value the resiliency above all else. It's sort of part of this pioneering American spirit. It's one of the things that can unite right and left when it comes to interviewing.